Well, welcome everybody to our Leaders in Housing Counseling call for December 3rd. Um, glad to have you. It's been a while since we've talked, so I'm glad to see where um, people are, are joining the call and, and we're um, moving forward. So glad to see that you are on. We have um, kind of a, a mix of things today coming up. So first is um, I was just going to do a quick update on just the conversations we're having around the Biden-Harris administration transition um, and what's going on, a couple different projects that we're working on that, um, you know, and, and actually would be helpful if, if, if there are people who have thoughts about what we should be including in, in a lot of these proposals and opportunities and suggestions on personnel. Um, and then um, uh, Melody, now Melody Zimmerman will be, um, giving our um, overview on the legislative updates, a lot of which is a lot of things happening, but not as conclusively as we want. And um, so she'll bring you up to date on all that and the good work she's doing. And most of the call will be on this theme of um, factory built housing, which of course manufactured housing and um, uh, pre-built, partially pre-built, all those elements um, are becoming a bigger factor in the affordable housing space. And we've got sort of the leading group next step to talk to us. And it's really a, a framework for what housing counselors should know about this in counseling your, your clients. And, um, and the importance here is that um, not everybody may be thinking, oh, this is the kind of housing that I want. And it will be helpful if we are good ambassadors for this when it's appropriate in your marketplace. So um, it's an issue we'll probably revisit um, uh, over the next few years as the opportunities grow with, with uh, factory built housing. And um, so this is a, uh, another step in the process. We've had a couple discussions about, about this topic. And we'll make a quick plug on NHRC membership. Came into the office today, and there was I was delighted to see seven more groups have renewed their membership. Um, and uh, we're glad to have you in the fold, uh, or keep in, staying in the fold. Um, and please uh, imagine, um, think about joining us, um, making sure to get caught up this year still, and, and put us in your budget for 2021. So with that note, let's go and, and talk about the Biden-Harris administration. So um, things are moving forward and it's being recognized um, in the in DC that um, the election is, is definitive enough that things can move forward. Um, and we have reached out to um, a number of uh, uh, partners that we know who are part of the administration um, uh, transition teams. And we had an early memo that went out Oh, a month ago to um, uh, actually through Maxine Waters' office to really outline several major housing counseling issues. Um, and I think we, we included in that some of the broader issues like um, um, rolling back the disparate impact and um, the, uh, uh, affordable, uh, the furthering fair housing, um, affirmatively fair housing, rule and the, the Community Reinvestment Act rules that uh, have been um, damaging to kind of our general work and, and the communities we work in. Um, and we think, um, so we're, we, those have been submitted. We've, we're working on a much more comprehensive list that does cover um, a good deal more. Um, I mean, one of the, I think the big things, we're, we're, some of this is very short term, um, things like Getting rid of the uh, um, that executive order that prevents federal workers from uh, participating in um, trainings that speak to things like systemic racism and um, uh, those broad issues. Um, th so some things that can be done on day one. But we're also thinking a lot about what can be done on a larger term to have um, um, movement forward on on a comprehensive home ownership strategy not unlike what they did um, uh, uh, years ago during the Clinton administration with Henry Cisneros and crew. Um, and uh, there's a, a lot of interest in the committee on especially doing some special programming 
around black home ownership um, for all the reasons that we all are painfully aware of, but also that it's in general, um, especially in communities of color, and especially for low and moderate income people in this environment, that there be a real interagency push and effort to uh, change the um, uh, dynamic here and, and using the levers of, of the federal government to be a big, to, to make that happen. So that's all um, pretty positive. One of the things we're gonna include as well is a call for um, the new HUD secretary when they come in that this round for fiscal year 2022, so the one that theoretically would start October 1 of 2021, um, that the budget that they'll start working on fairly shortly um, includes $100 million for housing counseling. And we have been down in the basement with $45 million for the last several years um, uh, with the, in the president's budget. And that's been uh, very difficult because when Congress comes together, that, that's, the, that's, a, that's a place where they start their discussions. Um, we, did, um, we did a lot of good work this year, and so we're able to get the Senate position and through Melody's work to be able to, be, uh, to have a higher starting point. Um, last year's 53 million, and, um, and, and again, in, in the House, we're at 75 million. So, you know, it's a, usually a decision between the two. So that's an opportunity, um, but we want the base to be larger, and that's uh, why we're pushing for 100 million. And, um, you know, we've shopped this around with some people, and we are, um, uh, we think that's an, op it's an opportunity that um, we, we think that there's interest in doing this. So we will continue to push this and, and try to keep it alive. Um, there's a lot more, you know, protections for DACA recipients and FHA loans, try to have better forbearance policies. We have, we'll have a lot of mechanics in there, um, but uh, our, our real goal is to integrate housing counseling just much more effectively in programs. And we think we will have much better access in this administration. So that's very good. Um, uh, some of you may know um, Megan McCarthy, who was at Housing Partnership Network, HPN, uh, most recently and before that in the Senate. She's on the transition team and has deep understanding in housing counseling. And our friend, um, uh, Julia Gordon, who is um, uh, currently the, on leave from being the, the president of the um, National Stabilization Trust. She's uh, um, also deeply understands housing counseling and the need for this as a really a tool to get uh, to increase home ownership in this country among um, the underserved populations. Um, so she's also there. So we do have two really good voices. Uh, but I think there, there's a lot of attention being paid and, and uh, um, we're encouraged. Um, so anybody has any thoughts about things we might be missing or anything like that, we, you know, feel free to shoot us an email. We are um, right now in the process of putting pen to paper and or finger on, <laughs> on, on uh, keyboard to develop all this. Um, the second thing is um, personnel is policy. Um, you know, it's really important that they have the right people in who have, who believe that government can work and that they believe that um, uh, that it's important to have good, smart, targeted housing programs that can deliver to the communities that we work in. And um, to that end, we are making an effort to recruit people who we think um, or you think might be good prospects for doing this work um, in, in the federal government. And the, the Biden administration is going to need to hire fairly quickly some three to 4,000 positions. And um, uh, some of them are at HUD, the Treasury, the CFPB, um, for sure. Uh, there may be some who knows what will happen with FHFA, um, uh, with their possibilities. The, um, so this is all part of the mix. And we are, um, we're in, we've involved ourselves with the Revolving Door Project. This is a coalition of groups that are doing good government, uh, government transparency, um, uh, groups that are opposed to the heavy influence of Wall Street in, um, uh, 
in government, economic policies, uh, environmental groups, labor groups, and we're helping with um, identifying housing prospects in this, in this mix. And they have, they're creating their version of the plum book or the um, uh, people who, who are potential recruits. Um, and we, um, uh, we're, so we're submitting names. Uh, so one of the names we submitted that you're probably very familiar with is um, Sarah Jarek. That would be very good to get her back into HUD. And uh, you know, it's an example of somebody who really worked well in the administrations, various administrations, and uh, was able to really manage the bureaucracy and also do a lot of interagency work that's had that's helped our work tremendously. And um, you know, having her at a higher position at HUD would be really useful. Um, and, um, another person who's been on our call is Mark McArdle. At the, he's now at the CFPB, but he ran HAMP at Treasury. Um, somebody who's very accessible, very smart, has a sense of humor, which is really helpful in this work. Uh, and so we've um, encouraged people to think about him. Uh, some people from your ranks, um, from the housing counseling world, are, are putting their hat in and we are um we think that's very exciting and um we so the opportunity here is if you think there are people that are currently working in government or in the nonprofit field that you feel would be excellent at this who have deep experience who have some knowledge um, and they could be young too i mean just relatively starting out um, we do want people who might become career people and become um more deeply committed to making government work and restoring some of the um, uh, the lost staff positions that that happened in the previous administration. Uh, so if if you've got people you're interested in, uh, we do have a survey. We did send it to some of you, and and feel free to um, fill that out with people. I think it's always best to talk to the people ahead of time. Um, they can help provide you know their resume and contact information. But it's it, it, people feel honored that you talk to them and ask them about it, um, and it's a way to make the job of, of getting the stuff entered easier. But we have a short survey that um, captures that information. Ellie's managing it, and she does so many of our things so well, and uh, she'll be moving forward with, uh, she'll take those and put them into the database. Um, I know they submitted one round already, but there's plenty of room, and. We're not really talking about cabinet positions here. We're probably talking step down, or, um, and you know that this it's still it's a very good timing to, to get more names in. One thing that's not about the Biden Harris administration, but just wanted to acknowledge um, is that at HUD in the Office of Housing Counseling, there's a new director. Uh, we put it out. It's it's uh, David Berenbaum, who probably many of you, if not most of you know, he certainly had been on our calls in the past, certainly gone to lots of our meetings and participated in the leaders' conferences. He is, um, uh, and has a long history of being at HPF and at uh, um, uh, NCRC before that, um, and has done a lot of good work um, in our field and, and is deeply familiar with this. So he's gonna be the new director of the Office of Housing Counseling, He'll certainly be an advocate. Um, he'll, I'm sure, take a thoughtful approach and will be a, a, an asset for our work as well. So it just strengthens us. And it is nice to have people from our ranks becoming higher and higher in, in the process of, the, of um, uh, programming and government and um, policy making. So one more thought there. And I'll just mention um, Jean Spencer, who's also been on our calls, passed away um, uh, uh, a week ago or a few days ago. Um, sort of a sad thing. He was um, for a long time at, at HPF and at the end took um, David Barenbaum's place as the director of, at HPF, the Housing Preservation Foundation. Um, and um, so we're, we're sad to hear about his passing. Well, good. With that, we're going to move forward and um, we'll go to Melody. Melody, tell us what's happening in DC and the Congress. 
Hi, everyone. I hope um, you all can hear me okay. Uh, I'll try to be really succinct to give time to um, our, our larger presentation today, but it's been a really busy three days so far of December. Um, we're, I'm, I'm really happy to report that after several months of um, failed talks between House and Senate leadership as well as with the White House, there's been a, sort of a, a jolt, if you will, of movement um, when we found out that the problem solver carcass, which is a bicameral, um, which is both chambers, I should say, uh, bipartisan um, caucus of lawmakers came together to sort of try to find middle ground and provide some sort of framework uh, for stimulus funding. So they came out on Tuesday with a four month bipartisan emergency relief framework um, to sort of help households, businesses, uh, and workers, as well as healthcare providers through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, a few of the names that were behind this caucus, you might uh, recognize them. Uh, Co-chair is Tom Reed, who is uh, on the House side, not Senator uh, Reed, um, as well as a few on the Senate side, Senators Manute, um, Manchin, excuse me, um, Senator Collins, uh, Warren, uh, Senator K um, Cassidy, Senator Mikowski from Alaska, as well as Senator Mitt Romney from Utah, a really prominent sort of middle of the road um, Republicans and Democrats who really just want to um, close out this year with emergency aid. Their framework allocates $908 billion in total aid, and this includes new funding, as well as a reallocation of previously appropriated funds from the CARES Act, which passed in late March. Um, just the initial review of it, uh, it's obviously not sufficient at meeting every single immediate need that has presented itself through the pandemic, uh, and significantly less than the HEROES Act, which passed in, I believe, May from the House, which had three trillion for um, total relief, as well as the $100 million for the Housing Counseling Assistance Program. This framework only hits a couple of um, top line items that the Problem Solver Caucus felt was the most immediate, immediate need, um, including $25 billion for housing assistance for rental, which NHRC does support, um, but obviously we're pretty disappointed that housing counseling is not in there. Uh, that being said, this is a framework. It's being used to sort of um, bring together uh, leadership in both chambers as a starting point for conversations and negotiations. Um, we anticipate that it's probably too late to advocate for changes, um, such as including housing counseling funds in the framework, only because uh, this is clearly something they want to move on quickly. Um, and people are still anticipating that they would have an additional stimulus package um, come the new year when Biden takes office. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, as well as uh, Majority Leader, to Minority Leader Schumer in the Senate, were pushing for two trillion dollars um, in their last negotiation. But they're very much saying to the public, as well as for the lawmakers, that the need to act is immediate. This is a direct quote. And we believe that good faith negotiations will come to an agreement. Um, so I feel it was very important to mention that on a coronavirus front. However, there are other negotiations that are taking place at the same time, in particular, fiscal year 2021 uh, funding. So uh, I believe it was last week, it was before Thanksgiving holiday, uh, Senate Appropriations Chair Richard Shelby from Alabama um, felt that we would need an additional stop get funding bill um, by December 11th, obviously, because that is a deadline for federal funding before it runs out. And I'm certain no one right now wants uh, a government shutdown, in particular the White House. So we anticipate that they will move very quickly on this. Um, so yes, negotiators, negotiators haven't resolved their issues on well, there are differences, I should say, on issues pertaining to, say, border wall funding, um, policing restrictions, and some others. Um, but yes, the current stop get funding law expires next week, and so we anticipate there will be some kind of short CR. Um, 
that I said in the previous call, what we are excited about is that Senator Shelby uh, seems to be supportive of the Housing Counseling Assistance Program at HUD because NHRC linked him to housing counselors in the state, and they made an excellent case as to why additional funds would be needed, at least for their state. So after years and years of advocacy, uh, this is the first time in several cycles that the Senate has not act moved thus far to cut funding for the Housing Counseling Assistance Program and instead in the 302B allocation, which is the funding levels for each program that was published um, a few weeks ago from Senate Appropriations, we have Housing Counseling on the Senate side at 53 million. And this is really good for us because as Bruce was saying before, when the Senate number is higher, um, it makes it easier during the reconciliation process to sort of settle on a higher number. When the Senate number is lower, obviously, uh, we anticipate less, if anything, of a funding increase. So we're really, really excited about um, that update. And then just very quickly, just a few more updates on the probes. Obviously, next session is going, uh, there's gonna be a new Congress next session, as well as a new administration. Um, and there's a few changes to our, um, the committees that we follow, both on the House and the Senate side. So just to give everyone an idea, the current House Appropriations outgoing chair is Nia Lowy, I can never pronounce her name, sorry, Southern accent, Nita Lowey from New York. Uh, she was the appropriations chair for a moment, but she has left. And the uh, Senate, the Senate, the House uh, Policy Committee voted to have Rosa DeLauro um, as the upcoming appropriations chair. Um, this is huge <laughs> um, because it's going to definitely change uh, priorities in House appropriations is gonna change potentially our advocacy. Uh, she's a House member from Connecticut. So anyone on the call from Connecticut who has any relationships with her office, we would love to hear from you. Um, just so that when we start our advocacy strategies for the upcoming Congress, we have a better baseline as to what we can reach out to our office for. Um, but she was widely endorsed by her colleagues in the House labor unions and other um, groups advocating for women, women and children. Um, I believe that her previous record was leaning more towards the labor, HHS, and education side. Um, so I'm excited at the prospect of reaching out to her specifically on housing. And also with that, I just wanted to say that Senator Lamar Alexander from Tennessee um, is retiring. So he sat on the Senate Appropriations t head subcommittee. Um, and he has a lot of clout in the Senate. He served for 18 years. Um, so not really sure who's going to replace him. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, we'll obviously keep all of you updated on any changes uh, in members in either chamber. But I would say that concludes my update. Oh, no, it does not. One more thing, sorry, very, very busy. We finally completed our um, sign, on letter, sign on letter drive. Um, because we anticipate an omnibus bill um, in the upcoming weeks, because as I said, the stopgap funding for the federal government ends next week, December 11th, we wanted to reach out to both chambers, um, both House, House and Senate Appropriations Committees, asking them to meet the House number of $75 million for housing counseling assistance. Thank you so much to everyone whose organization signed on. We have a little bit uh, close to 140 signatures um, from around the country and a pretty good spread of states. So thank you everyone. That letter will be going out to uh, respectful committees uh, later this afternoon following the call. Thank you. Excellent. Um, you know, really good work. Thanks everybody who jumped in on the sign on letter. Uh, I know it was a quick turnaround and uh, but it's very valuable. It's, it's targeted. The Coalition for HUD Intermediaries did um, a similar letter uh, uh, two weeks ago. And the idea was we want to follow up here and keep it on on top of people's radar so that we're um, uh, we're, we're 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 doing as much as we can to um, um, keep the, the numbers alive and, and valuable. So just to support your work, it's what we're all about. Um, 
Good. Well, with that, let's turn to the, fe the um, featured speakers and let me have um, Ellie Pepper step up and, and uh, set, set the conversation up. Thanks, Bruce. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, you might remember some of you that we had a session um, earlier this year, late last year, on manufactured housing and factory built housing and how it can be used for affordable housing. And we had uh, folks from Next Step on the call, as well as you know some other people from um, different organizations. But we've invited uh, Kelly Fleck, the program manager, and Shelly Trent, the training coordinator, back to do a more in-depth presentation about how to integrate housing council, uh, factory bill housing into your housing counseling program. So I'm going to hand the controls over uh, to them so that they can show their slides. Take it away. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Bruce and Ellie, for hosting Next Step today. And I think we can all agree that now more than ever, we uh, need all the resources that we can get to help folks achieve affordable housing. So um, today in this session, we are going to share with you some tools and practices that will help you deliver services that are specific to factory built housing in your day to day programming. And earlier in the year, um, we conducted a survey with this very network asking housing counselors how much they time they spent on factory built housing in their home buyer workshops and their one on one counseling sessions. And 74% of the respondents indicated that they spent 15 minutes or less on manufactured housing. And so what we learned from that survey is that we still have a lot of work to do. And again, we just really want to equip you, um, give you uh, tactical ways that you can um, make your customers aware that factory built housing is an option for affordable housing. And after today's session, we are also going to share uh, tools and resources with you that you can use. Would you like to advance, Shelley? So we feel that you need to know who Next Step is. Um, Next Step is um, a nonprofit organization. We work with mission-driven nonprofits all across the country. We work with qualified and quality-oriented uh, factory-built retailers lenders and community operators, and we really bring everyone's expertise together and leverage that um, to help communities across the country in both rural and urban uh, communities. And now I'd just like to introduce Shelly Trent. Shelly is our training coordinator, and she will be sharing uh, more about our program. Thanks, Kelly. So in today's session, we're going to review the program's uh, purpose, today's program's purpose, um, the definitions of factory built homes, the review of the five core competencies that we have determined. And finally, we're going to show you how Next Step and your agency can reconnect after this program to help ensure that you incorporate factory built housing into your work. As this graphic shows, the home options include not only single and multifamily homes, townhouses and condos, cooperatives and land lease, but also factory built homes. And that's not just for you, but to help your clients see the full scope of their options. So let's talk about factory built housing, also known as manufactured housing. We need to establish some common terminology. Quote unquote mobile homes came about in the 1920s with automobile pulled trailer coaches. These were designated as a home away from home during camping trips and trailers later evolved into the mobile homes that were brought into demand after World War II ended. <clears throat> Veterans came home after the war and needed housing. And so, you know, at that time, homes were in short supply. Mobile homes provided inexpensive housing for, for veterans and their families, and being mobile allowed them to go wherever the jobs were. In June of 1976, Congress passed the National Manufactured Housing Construction and Safety Act, 
uh, which assured that all homes were built to tough national standards. And then in 1980, Congress approved changing the term mobile home to manufactured home. Yes, people still call them mobile homes 40 years later. And we hope you'll help us educate people about this incorrect terminology. Manufactured homes are built in a factory and must conform to the HUD Federal Building Code. And so homes like this one in the photo are not the norm. As I mentioned earlier, on June 15th, 1976, um, oh, sorry. Um, skip the slide here. Today's homes are providing great value and the homes you see on your slide are both manufactured homes and they are absolutely adorable. They have energy efficiency, um, they're safe, they cost substantially less to build than a comparably sized site built home and the benefits of factory built homes include quality construction, customization options, outstanding designs and curb appeal as well as the modern amenities and livability people want in a home. And they can be built with, as you see, porches and garages, um, higher roof pitches, and much more. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So again, as we mentioned, on June 15, 1976, HUD established construction and safety standards for mobile homes because they were becoming widely used as permanent housing and no longer really mobile. And the Federal Manufactured Home Construction and Safety Standards, also known as the HUD Code, are the regulations that govern today's manufactured housing. So again, mobile homes are no longer being built. The HUD Code, unlike conventional building codes, requires manufactured homes to be constructed on a permanent chassis. And manufactured homes are single family and can be single or multi-section. A manufactured home inspection is a complete inspection of the home from the roof to the ground and it's conducted by a third party so it's not conducted by the builder. There, there are specific areas that are thoroughly inspected such as roofs, plumbing, electricity, heating and cooling and flooring and once the home is placed on site additional inspections are completed. And modular homes are built to conform to all state, local, and or regional codes that apply based on the final location of the home. So these are a little bit different. Again, um, modular codes are built to local and state code and manufactured homes are built to the HUD code. Please note that tiny homes and container homes are not the same as manufactured homes. Tiny homes are built to an RV code and not meant for long-term living. They can be moved anywhere, unlike a manufactured home, which is meant to stay in one place. So let's see if you can tell the difference between manufactured, modular, and site-built homes. If you're not familiar with that term, a site-built home is a house constructed entirely or largely on the site which it will occupy upon its completion rather than in a factory. And please notice that we do not use the term stick built because manufactured homes are built with the same materials as site built homes, with the same sticks, I guess. <laughs> so what do you think about this? We were gonna have time to do a little quiz, but I think we'll, we'll just get through this part and let you guess on your own, what do you think it is manufactured, modular or site built? This one is manufactured. This one is actually in San Bernardino, California. <clears throat> about this one in Phoenix? Manufactured, modular, or site built? This one is modular, built to the local code. What about this one with the pretty stone on the bottom? This one is actually site built, but I wanted to show you this picture because many manufactured homes look like this and they can be built with stone accents. How about this one in Moorhead, Kentucky? This is manufactured. It's actually one of the first homes that Next Step built. What's your guess on this one? This one is site built, but it looks very similar to a manufactured home. And I wanted to show you this one because you can put brick on a manufactured home. How about this one? It's a multifamily home. It's a Southwestern Adobe style. This is manufactured. I bet some of you are surprised, but, but this is a beautiful manufactured home. What about this one on the Gulf Coast? It's a duplex. 
This one's modular, built to local code. It's adorable with all of gingerbread. How about this one in Colorado? This one is side built, but it has a very similar roof pitch um, that a manufactured house can have. What about this Adobe style home? This one's manufactured. And here is a neighborhood in Knoxville, Tennessee. This one's manufactured. It's actually a Clayton Homes development. So hopefully you've seen that manufactured homes do not look like mobile homes or trailers anymore. They are actually beautiful homes. In fact, let me show the, you the interior of some manufactured homes. Uh, this is a beautiful kitchen. Uh, it's amazing to me. I, I would live here. It's so cozy. <clears throat> amazing kitchen with granite counters, stainless appliances, crown molding, canned lighting. And this cozy kitchen, uh, the ceiling is so cute. It has a, a wooden range hood, wood counters, open shelving. This is a manufactured home. This lovely bathroom has extra space um, for storage. It has double sinks, it has a tiled walk-in shower. And this cozy living room uh, looks like a good place to sit with a blanket in front of the fireplace and read a good book. But again, this is a manufactured home. As is this. This bedroom is quite glamorous. It has a lot of light, crown molding, can lights above the bed, large woodwork. Um, so again, these are beautiful interiors. Another topic I think you're going to find quite interesting is that Consumers Union, which is the publisher of Consumer Reports magazine, assessed the financial appreciation of manufactured housing units versus site-built housing and found that, quote, average appreciation rates of manufactured homes packaged with own land, meaning sitting on property, that the buyer would own are st statistically in line with the site built market and there are a few inherent reasons that a home built in a factory should perform differently than one built on site. This basically means that the appreciation rates of manufactured homes are about the same as those of site built homes. So your uh, clients will be getting appreciation in their home just as much as they would if it were a site built home. And so here's also a chart. This is from FHFA providing evidence showing that manufactured homes appreciate as well as site built homes. So how much will a new home cost? Prices are affected by geography, uh, the housing market, the homes amenities, building materials, which we know are higher right now and land cost. And as you'll see, the price can vary widely based on those factors. A new single section home factory invoice ranges from 28,000 to 50,000. A new multi-section factory home ranges from 50 to 120. And again, it's based on size. So the total development costs could be invoice price multiplied by two if a home is placed on a permanent foundation. Community home placement is less expensive, meaning if they put it in a manufactured home development, then it they bought their own piece of property because they would have to pay for setup of that property, um, which would include like running utilities, building a driveway, taking out trees, things like that, which of course adds expense. Um, typical setup in a community is 15 to 20,000. Um, and your um, client, if they purchase land and they pay for the installation and setup, it's still less expensive than a site built home. So Kelly, I will turn it back over to you for the next few slides. Thank you, Shelley. So it's important to um, recognize our partnerships with Fannie Mae and uh, Freddie Mac through the duty to serve requirement. And Fannie Mae has provided funding for the development of this program and will continue to work with us as we provide trainings in the future. And Freddie Mac provided past funding for the development of our e-home course that is on manufactured housing. And it's actually designed for home buyer education specific to manufactured housing. So we, we really want to um, just uh, give, give credit to both uh, Fannie and Freddie. Next. 
So you might be asking yourself right now, why is this important? Well, all that we are sharing with you today is recommended and is considered standard. And so it really comes down to this, um, including factory built housing into your counseling and your education services may result in new responsibilities or, or more time spent with clients. But the counselor's role is, is overall unchanged. It's really just about um, presenting factory built housing as an option. Um, both the national industry standards and HUD approved housing counseling agencies expect counselors to share information on all housing types, and that includes factory built housing. Um, HUD also expects you to be competent in pre-purchase home selection and national industry standards set a benchmark for your knowledge to represent types of homes. And that of course includes factory built housing. And one um, thing I think that you're gonna be excited about is that this also means that your organization can be compensated for offering counseling and education in factory built housing, the same way that you're compensated for pre-purchase topic, other pre-purchase topics. So um, most funding sources will support pre-purchase education and, and um, factory built housing as part of that program service delivery. Next. I'm back up. Yep. So Next Step can provide online copies of a document called a service guide for counselors on factory built housing, a consumer interest guide on factory built housing, and a list of the five competencies for factory built housing, which include understanding, financing, and integrating factory built housing into your education and counseling programs, Indicate, uh, integrating factory built housing into program management, and tools and resources Next Step has available for you. The Consumer Interest Guide is a tool that easily encapsulates broader content for when your clients start exploring their home options. And it's very useful if they're heading out to retailers to look at homes. And these resources and others are available in Next Step's online counselor toolkit, which we will send you more information about following this webinar. So what is factory built housing? We talked about it a little bit already, but they're homes that are built or constructed to near completion inside a facility and then transported to a site. That's the simple view. We're going to get into the broader details in a moment, but why might a factory um, or a facility be a better place to build a home than one at an open site? And so why build in a factory? And we're going to talk about that in a second, but each of these factory built home pictures are not just visually appealing, they represent some serious quality and value. So there are five competencies for counselors to know about factory built homes and let's talk about the first one, understanding the options and elements of factory built homes. There are several types, we talked about some of them already. Manufactured homes are built as complete sections upon steel chassis with wheels attached. Home sections are transported to the site and installed. Ideally, they are affixed to a permanent foundation and they have to be affixed to a permanent foundation for certain types of loans. Sometimes people inc incorrectly, again, call them trailers or mobile homes. But as I mentioned earlier, mobile homes were built to have built in a factory prior to 1976 when the HUD code went into effect and are no longer built. So we need to start calling them manufactured homes or factory built homes and not mobile homes. So today's uh, factory built home is a multitude of steps further into making the differences in home option construction more indiscernible and less costly. Modular homes, again, are built in a factory and transported in sections to the home site and installed. They're designed and, oops, they're designed and constructed. My finger got a little ahead of me there. Uh, in compliance with state or regional codes where the home will be located and placed on a permanent foundation. They can even have a basement. That might surprise you, but yes, uh, manufactured and modular homes can be put on a basement as long as there's space um, for stairs. And when your clients go out shopping, if they really want a basement or they already have a property and they can uh, four basements, 
um, they can talk to the retailer about uh, designing or, or purchasing a home that's designed for that. <clears throat> and panelized homes are basically whole walls with windows, doors, wiring, and siding that are transported to the site and assembled. They have to meet local and state business, uh, sorry, building codes where they're sited. Pre-cut homes are factory cut to design specification. And these are like kit homes, log homes, and dome homes and must meet local and state building codes. Uh, requirements. So let's dig a little bit deeper on that earlier question. Factory built homes are built in a controlled environment, indoors, out of the weather. Because the homes are built indoors with no delays from weather or theft of materials, and because they're built on a manufacturing line, they can be completed quickly in about one quarter of the time it takes to build a site built home. The homes can be built with modern design elements like granite counters, tile, stainless appliances, and other amenities as you saw earlier. They can also be built with energy efficiency and safety features such as energy star ratings and high wind ratings. Factory built homes are also inspected just like site built homes are. <clears throat> the big takeaway for your, uh, your clients and customers should be this, this graphic. Factory built can ensure uniformity and precision in craftsmanship. It's precisely the same concept for each individual feature of a home. If you expect your distinct parts, bricks, roofing, shingles, windows, HVAC, plumbing, all that to be put together in a factory, why wouldn't it make sense for the whole home? Kelly, what do you think? Well, I'm sold, Shelly. Um, you've shown us some, some beautiful homes. So one question that often comes up is how do you finance factory built homes? And um, as counselors, we want to be able to guide our consumer to the best financing options available that meets their needs. And it's intrinsically one of our primary functions. Um, although factory built homes are sometimes financed in the same way as a traditional site-built home, um, they may involve a different process and it could also involve a different pool of lenders. And it's gonna depend on the type of placement of the home. So for manufactured homes, there's two types of financing methods that are most often used. One is called a uh, land home or it could also be referred to as a mortgage, and that's what you're probably most familiar with. And we also refer to home only loans, which are sometimes referred to as chattel loans. And we'll talk more about these in the upcoming slides, but I would like to encourage you to first investigate with your primary lending sources that you are using right now to learn what they have available uh, for factory built housing. It might be that the lenders you're currently working with offer some type of loan product for, for factory built housing. And it's an, uh, a good idea to keep a, a resource list of the lenders that um, are available in your community. And we also have a list on our website of, of Next Step Network lender members that you could refer to as well. And many are um, nationwide lenders as well. Next. So the home, how it's classified is going to determine the financing method. Mortgages, you're all familiar with a mortgage. And, um, but in the factory built housing industry, you may hear someone refer to this as a land home loan. And mortgages are used for new homes, existing homes, and they can be used for the installation of a factory built home on a permanent foundation. And it's on land that is owned. Um, these types of loans are considered real property. They, the borrower will have a deed, and this mirrors uh, most common lending options that you're used to working with. Now the home only loan, sometimes referred to as a chattel loan, is a type of financing for only the manufactured home. So this, this home is unaffixed to property 
and that's based on the different anchoring uh, requirements. And the, the land is financed separately, or perhaps it's already owned, or maybe it's in a community. And this is a, a personal property loan. And um, again, you might hear this referred to as a chattel loan. So a home that is sited has already been transported to the site and installed. And the home could be new or it could be pre-owned. A sited home can be lo located on private land in a subdivision or a land leased community. Um, an unsighted home uh, is, is, is most often uh, a chattel loan. Next. So once your clients have identified the type of classification of land and the home options that they're interested in pursuing, the financing options follow some highly universal concepts. So for example, the home buyer's credit and capacity are similarly measured and requirements for down payment are comparable. Um, we recommend that you know what local resources that you have in your community, um, what loan products are offered, um, check with lenders who promote conventional affordable housing uh, products, first-time homeowner products. Um, of course, remember that um, government products would also come into play here, FHA, VA, USDA, and of course, Fannie and Freddie have now uh, two uh, loan products that put factory built housing on par with site built housing. And um, here is one other uh, thing I want to point out. Often retailers will um, offer some sort of financing there on the lot. Um, it often resembles uh, a personal loan, and it's not really our first option that we would recommend. Um, sometimes these uh, loans have a higher interest rate, but it is something that is offered and you should be aware of. And it, we just want to point out that um, any Fannie or any uh, Freddie or government loans will require that the home be converted to real property and that it meet HUD guidelines. And there are some home size guidelines that are, um, that come into play as well. Next. So in this next section of the program, we're really gonna talk about how to incorporate factory built housing into your home buyer education ses sessions, your one-on-one -on -one counseling appointments, what type of, um, uh, topics that you can cover and how to use um, a spaces tool that we came up with and, and how to integrate uh, counseling into your marketing strategies as well. Next. So um, factory built homes may be attractive to your clients because of their affordability, their energy efficiencies, their amenities, and the speed of delivery. Although factory built housing options have been around for many years, we tend to forget to include these details about factory built housing in our programming. And we need a little guidance and some base um, knowledge. So here are a few ways that you could incorporate factory built housing into your programming. Um, in your workshops, you could insert details about uh, budgeting. Um, you know, showing that factory built housing is an affordable option. You could pair the, you could compare funds that were needed for down payment and closing costs. Um, and remember to consider um, how the upkeep and maintenance could impact your overall budgeting. Talk about how to get these homes financed. Um, you could incorporate a case study where the family is purchasing a modular home or a factory built home and you could include options um, for factory built housing. Um, also think about if this is a route that your 
consumer is interested in, will they need to work with a realtor or not? Maybe not. Um, if they're going directly to a retailer. If they have to purchase land, then maybe they will need it. Um, but, but once your borrower has been pre-approved, you su should suggest that the buyers um, visit a retailer, a local retailer. And that's something that you could include um, in your workshops is a list of local um, reputable factory built housing sellers that you know provides a quality home. Um, also, you could end uh, your, your class by including a question on your class survey, just asking, you know, would you like more information on um, certain types of homes and include manufactured housing as one of those types. And really, it's all about representation. Um, if, if we don't present this as a housing option, our consumers might not ever imagine or develop an interest in factory built housing because they may not realize it as an affordable housing option. And it really could be the most affordable to them. And we just want you to help them realize that. And um, of course, if anyone indicates that they are interested in learning more about factory built housing, we have developed a consumer interest guide that the consumer can use um, on their own to help them think through um, that purchase. Next. We've also developed a PowerPoint for counselors to use in their uh, workshops that, and you will receive this PowerPoint as um, one of the tools. And um, again, we are going to share that with you later on. And then also we have on our website what we call um, our, um, um, anyway, it's a little calculator there. Um, Next Steps Total Home Calculator, sorry. And it shows you um, the costs. It helps your borrower start to think about that comparison of what a factory built home might cost me compared to um, a site built or an existing home. So this is just something that you could use on your one-on-one -on -one sessions or in your workshops. Next. Next up is also develop, developed a tool, our Down Payment Seeker. And we have partnered with Down Payment Resources. Down Payment Resources actually has a national engine of um, down payment assistance programs across the country. And what's unique about our down payment seeker is this match is in, uh, it includes all programs that will allow for factory built housing. So um, you don't have to sort through every program to figure out on your own if um, this down payment assistance program allows factory built housing or not. And so that's something that's also hosted on our website. We won't take you through um, a live presentation for the sake of time, but um, basically you will need to, um, the borrower will just need to put in some information about their property, about their household income and size, and then any special circumstances uh, if, if they are working for a school system or in the medical field, they may qualify for some special um, down payment assistance programs. And this is just a way to help um, your borrowers learn about what programs are in their community and, and uh, early in the process so that they can, can, can know about resources available to them. Next. So we realize that um, information happens in your education sessions and decisions happen in your one-on-one -on -one counseling. So counseling on factory built housing, it really doesn't require um, any more staff time, but it does require a basic level of understanding. And since housing counselors need to provide uh, details on all housing types, Counselors should have a plan of how they're going to identify that concept and provide 
uh, information at different points of the counseling timeline. So here are a few ways that you could integrate factory built housing into your one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions. So during the first meeting, perhaps you could ask about um, what types of housing your client has considered um, and review what options might be affordable for them and ask them, have they considered uh, factory built housing? You could uh, follow up on this topic at subsequent counseling sessions, um, ask about their interest in different housing types, and remember to notate any discussions in your counselor log. And in the tools section, we have provided with you with a counselor checklist so that um, as you're doing that one-on-one -on -one session, you can um, remember to include these topics. And so um, that, that checklist also includes live links that you can um, give you access to a lot of tools. And so um, take advantage of your current um, client management systems. Um, all systems that I'm aware of offer the possibility to customize. So think about fields that um, you could collect broader information for uh, reporting purposes and for information gathering add a question to your intake packet. Um, so, um, and just ask who is interested in factory built housing and then build a strategy based on what you've learned. And um, of course, then you can build this guidance into your, your programming. Next. Um, I kind of talked about this checklist, but here's a quick glimpse at, at what it looks like. And this is an interactive tool, so you can actually write your notes right in the, the, um, the sections. And as a housing counselor, I would have found this very helpful when I was conducting those one-on-one -on -one appointments. Next. Um, Consider integrating factory built housing into your marketing. Um, think about including a photo of a factory built house. Um, use uh, language that is uh, supportive of factory built housing. Um, include it on your website, create a blog or a story. And um, we have a graphic on this next um, slide, Shelley our spaces graphic. This is a graphic that's designed to help borrowers think about their spaces. Um, and we see it as there are six pillars um, that target housing. And, and so these are, this is a sheet that you could print off, hand it to them, and they could take it with them when they're shopping for a home. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to read this in, in detail. It's in your packets, but they need to think about the site or where your, hand, your home is going to be located. Think about precision. Um, make sure you know that it's code. It meets code. Uh, you want it to have curb appeal. The home should have high quality worth um, and appreciate and value. Um, your environment. Consider carefully where you want to live. This sheet is actually not just specific to factory built housing, but to any. To any, any home. And then, of course, you want to make sure that your home is energy efficient and it has quality infrastructure. So um, that, that is just another tool that is for you. Um, so before counselors run out and start engaging um, clients on the topic of factory built housing, of course, um, program managers should develop a management function that is related to factory built housing and regulations. Um, as with any content that you add to housing counseling um, and your education service model, you should consider how, when, and where this information will be included. Uniformity, is um, uniformity in delivery is key to compliance, and details need to be consistent, thorough, and universal. So um, define the process, train your staff, know what the local rules and regulations of factory built housing are. 
give updates on an annual basis. Um, provide your staff with um, the service guide for housing counselors and adjust your procedures as you need to and review often. And um, of course, you are going to want to update your, um, your work plans when you integrate factory built housing. Next, um, improve your client management system. We talked about um, asking questions that are related to factory built housing. Um, develop a system for tracking who's interested, who purchased a, a factory built home. Um, and, and then again, update your work plan. And these should be supported by your 9902 reporting. And then of course, um, any changes to any um, local regulations you would want to re update and, and um, keep your staff apprised of that. So Shelly, back to you. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, thanks, Kelly, and thanks to all of you for staying with us. Uh, here's the last bit of information uh, you can share with your clients. So we've created um, a, sort of a, a spreadsheet that you can type in. And again, this is in the tools, but you can type in for your area the information that goes in the spreadsheet. We, we think it's important for you to have a list of resources and options for your clients who are interested in factory builds housing options and some resources may be from national sources and others may require local research that you can uh, put into your uh, spreadsheet here. Resources should highlight things like local retailers, community owners, factories and suppliers like installers and transporters. Um, it should include real estate professionals, appraisers, insurers, and lenders who are well-versed in factory built housing. Lenders could include mortgage companies, banks, nonprofit lenders, credit unions, and secondary market investors like Freddie and Fannie. Relevant uh, local government entities should be referenced as well, such as zoning and code inspection and regulators and policymakers, uh, such as HUD, the EPA, Federal Housing Finance Agencies, Duty to Serve Program, etc. You can provide references to consumers, fellow educators, and counselors as well. And Next Steps uh, document called Local Resources for Factory Built Housing Worksheet provides an outline uh, for developing your list. It looks like what we have up here on the screen. And eHome America, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, they provide online comprehensive training for your clients about manufactured housing. Um, they actually have a specialized four hour program and they'll learn about the eight areas here, uh, selecting a home, planning for installation and siting, deciding where to place a home, understanding and securing financing, deciding where to uh, place it, understanding and securing financing, shopping for a home, caring for their home, and getting help if needed. So all of these things are covered in the eHome America Specialty Manufactured Housing Program. As a review, remember to do the research on local codes and regulations, review them with your staff, revise your education and counseling practices to include factory built housing and release the information to your clients. Kelly. Again, we would like to thank Fannie Mae um, for allowing us to create this program and for their support and just expanding the knowledge of factory built manufactured housing among counseling professionals. So thank you. And at this point, we would welcome any questions. Um, one thing I would like to point out is that um, with the eHome America course, because you have uh, stayed on this course, we can turn that offering on for your agency. And of course, you can be compensated in the same way you would be with any other eHome America course. So this could be um, a way to generate revenue for your organization. And if that's something that you're interested in, please reach out to, to myself. 
Thank you. Thank you both so much. I, I uh, want to let everybody know that uh, the PowerPoint that Kelly and Shelley just went through is available in the handouts. And if you aren't able to access it through the handout, just email me and, and I'll get it along to you. Uh, but I know that there's a lot of questions, so I'm going to hand it right over to Melody so that she can um, go through them and uh, let you know what they are. Melody. Hello. Thanks, Ellie. Um, first question goes to Kelly. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was great. I um, learned quite a few things myself. I briefly, when I was at um, Prosperity Now, they were working on manufactured housing as a pathway to affordable homeownership. And I was exposed to some of these things, but I mean, I think the field has also come a long way even in the last 10 years. So thank you for that. Um, the, we have a few questions about the, um, the types of modular manufactured homes and the quality of them. So the first question is, how do these homes usually stand up to hurricanes and tornadoes? I know we have a lot of um, members in the South with the deal of hurricanes and the like, as well as those sort of in the Midwest with tornadoes. And the second question is, um, do manufacturer modular homes have basements? Kelly, do you want me to take that one? Sure, sure. Sure, okay, so because I've done research on this. Um, as I mentioned in my part of the program, they are now built for high wind standards, um, especially if they're in a place that has a lot of weather issues they are built to withstand um, hurricane force winds. And an interesting story that I have heard is there was a tornado in, I believe it was East Tennessee, and a site-built development was right next door to a factory-built development. And the site-built development had destruction of homes and the manufacturer development did not. They are now built with such higher uh, wind standards um, and like I said, I've done quite a bit of research on this. And um, if you think about it this way, to travel to their site, they go down the highway at 70. So, <laughs> and they don't have any damage from the 70 mile an hour um, drive to the site. So um, I, was that the whole question or was there a second part? Um, the second part was, do they have basements? <laughs> Yeah, I addressed that in my uh, comments earlier too, that they can be built on a basement. It depends on the piece of property that the client has, if it's able to be put on a basement. Um, for instance, if there's, you know, issues with a lot of rock or, or you know, cave systems and things like that, it could, it, it depends on the piece of property, but yes, they can be built on basements. One thing I did not mention is that if your client goes to a retail lot, they are not only, um, they don't only have to choose from what's available on the lot. They can design a home, they can work with the retailer to um, choose a layout that has stairs so they can have a basement. It doesn't have to be something on the lot. Something can be built for them based on their needs. Thank you. The um, mm -hmm. next question here is, are develop sorry, back the noise. Um, are developers charging HOA dues or lot rents associated with the new manufacturer housing or modular housing? If it was, if the home was located in a, a, a community owned park, then there would be rent associated with that home, lot rent. Thank you. Um, do lenders provide construction lending until it's on foundation? What is the um, construction lending uh, process, if any? Um, there may be some lenders out there that provide um, construction financing. Uh, most are coming in with the permanent financing. You have to ask them. Depending on what it, it, your real your retailer also might, um, if you already own the land, um, work with you in that regard. Um, as Thank well. you. One other thing. Oops, sorry. That's okay. I was going to add something too. Um, some retailers have sort of a package deal where we talked about, you know, that the the consumer might have a plot of land, but that it needs to be developed with things like, you know, removing trees, setting up the foundation, um, running utilities, things like that. And some 
uh, retail lots will do that as a package deal. So everything's rolled into one loan. Thank you. Um, someone asked, um, is there a list of developers by region or by state? They were in the Midwest and they were curious. Do you mean uh, factories, maybe? Yes. Uh, I see. I, they did not say, but I assume that's what they meant. Yes. Right. Uh, there are factories all across the country. And um, if that's something your organization is interested in, we could certainly give you, uh, point you in the direction of the closest one to you in your location. Yeah, I recommend that you go on a tour of one. It's fascinating. Thanks. Um, we're going to move on to some of the questions um, for Shelly, I believe specifically. What is the range of interest rates for chattel loans? Uh, that That's a Kelly question. Yes. Oh, forgive me. <laughs> no. Well, typically you could see an interest rate as high as 12%. Those have come down a little bit just because we are, are seeing lower interest rates all across the board. But, um, you know, in the very recent past, you could see an interest rate of, at 12%, maybe even higher in some situations. But it depends on the bank. Thank or you. A, a retailer finance or yeah. Yes. Um, what's the lifespan of a FBH? As long as it's maintained well forever, just like a site built home. I mean, they're basically built just like a site built home, except they're built in a location away from the weather. I'll, you know, I'll always share when I built my first house, it was a site built and I went there every day after work to see the uh, work that they'd done and everything was out in the in the weather. And I, I have bad allergies. And so every day I worried about, oh, you know, all this wood is soaking wet and I'm going to have allergies from the mold, et cetera. But it's all built inside um, and then brought to the site. So um, as long as it's maintained, it will last as long as a site built. Thank you. Um, another um, fashion built home question. Some cities in Illinois have an ordinance against, against FBH. Um, is there any proposed legislation that they can present to the city administration? Um, I don't know if Kelly wants to take that, but I know that we work with groups on attempting to sort of lobby to change the zoning um, restrictions. That's something that we do across the board. I'm not sure. Kelly, do you know if they work with specific organizations or, or cities? I think they do. We have a policy um, arm to our organization, and that's something that um, if, if we could provide any information that would help you working in with those um, the, the local uh, ordinances, we could share information with you potentially if, if you let us know kind of what you're interested in and what you're looking for. Thank you. Um, is there an entity that folks can go to for information on local regulations about uh, manufactured and modular homes. Um, this attendee said they have 56 municipalities in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Trying to spend time to learn all the regulations about placing manufactured homes is daunting. Would the manufacturer have this information? Well, um, um, a local retailer may, and there's also state um, manufactured housing, um, I don't, what's the word I'm looking for? associations so you might start with your state association and they might be able to provide something thank you are there issues with appraisals for factory built versus site built homes um sometimes as as there would be um appraisal issues with with site built as well um one of the the beautiful things uh for instance um the MH Advantage is a new loan product that Fannie Mae has. And this loan product is basically meant 
to bring factory built housing um, on par with site built housing. And one of the features of this product is if there are not any MH um, advantage homes available uh, to use as a comparable, uh, you can use a site built comp, which to me is a real game changer. So. Yeah, and we have people who work with appraisers to train them more about how to appraise a manufactured home. So that's something that the whole industry is working on. Thank you. Um, I believe we've addressed uh, if manufactured or model homes can withstand different uh, weather environments, but someone just asked very quickly, are they able to withstand cold winters? Oh, of course, they have um, fantastic insulation. If you all get to visit um, a place where they build them a factory, you will be amazed at the products they use. They, they use all the same things that they build a site built house with. It's just built inside. All the products are the same or better. And uh, I'm not sure that we touched on this really much in the presentation, but the next step product um, we, these homes are energy star, so there is an energy efficiency uh, component to these homes. Thank you. Um, can factory built homes be transported to a new location? Well, you can move any home, but we don't recommend it. They're not meant to be moved once the home has been sited. Um, it's it's not really meant to be moved. They're on a permanent foundation. Yeah. Thank you. Final question. Um, is the interest rate on homes on permanent foundations the same as site built homes? And is insurance higher for these homes? Kelly, do you know that one? I, I think as with any loan, you would want to, to shop around. Those are questions that you would want to ask of the lender. Um, as far as homeowners insurance, um, you might have to do some educating to the insurance agent so that they are aware of um, the changes and, and the specs that these homes are being built to. Thank you. Those are all the questions. If somebody wants to email, I was going to say, if somebody wants to email us that question, we can look into it. I have one question to add, which is um, each of your pictures was for a one story building. Many of our cities really have two and three story buildings. What does that, do you do more than one story buildings? Um, you can have a, a two story factory built home. However, right now our factories are so busy and the demand is so high that they don't really have to, um, to offer that. I mean, it can be done, but it might take a little longer because it's, um, it's not something that they're regularly producing. It's not on the production line, but yes, it can, you can have a two story. And they're using manufactured developments now uh, for multifamily homes and apartment buildings and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. Duplex. Yeah. Thanks, Ellie. Do you want to close it out? Thanks so much, people. Sure. I'm going to take the screen back. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, and uh, just a quick reminder to join NHRC um, uh, or uh, renew your membership. Uh, like I said at the beginning of the call, we had seven new members, new seven renewals come in today. So we really appreciate that. And be sure to build us into your uh, 2021 budget to uh, keep us working and doing the kind of work, especially the kind of lobbying work that Melanie's doing. And 
things that are not going to get funded by um, um, outside sources. We really want to, we really value our independence, and this is a critical element to all that. So um, we still have the credit report discount and um, the savvy online student loans um, uh, program, which is very good and it looks like it's getting broader use by many institutions, um, but we have it available to you at a, at a pretty big discount. Um, and, and to your clients and importantly to your staff, um, as many people have pointed out, the, um, this is a way to make sure that people get into the best loan pro program they can get. And especially if they're working for a nonprofit, um, they can qualify for the, um, uh, the, the uh, program that would essentially um, allow them to pay off much earlier um, and has tremendous value. Um, but with that note, we're going to close it out for today. We'll, we're, we haven't decided on whether we'll do another call in December or not. It really depends, especially what happens in Congress. If there's a real breakthrough, um, I will we'll want to jump on that. But um, so keep an eye on the leaders list and we have um, we'll keep you informed. Uh, and if, if not, have a good, um, happy holiday and, and uh, glad to have you doing the work you're doing. Thanks so much, everybody.